Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name's Al Swigert. Um, how many of you saw Adrian's keynote this morning? Uh, yeah. Oh, man, it was great. So I saw Adrian uh, about 7.30 this morning. Um, I'm trying not to think about what time my body thinks it is, because I flew in from San Francisco. So like 7.30 minus 3 hours is like 6.30, or however math works when you're up that early. Uh, and so it's like, oh, hi, hey, how's it going? Hug, hello. The, s the first thing she says to me is, you're in one of my slides, um, <laughs> which is like kind of a threatening, intimidating thing to hear. Uh, it turns out, so uh, this was the thing that was in her slide. It was a tweet that I had made uh, not too long ago. Um, and what prompted this tweet was a friend of mine had been laid off recently, and now she's going through the whole, like, trying to interview, and she feels really dumb. Uh, she's taking some like online tests uh, that companies send her and they say like, oh, you can't look up anything or Google anything while you're taking this test. So basically all the people who pass that test are cheating. Um, but it's, uh, our industry does not know how to interview. So we, we kind of, like what makes a good software developer and how can you assess that within the span of like four or five hours. And that's a really hard question to answer. So a lot of people just go back to like, I don't know, let's ask questions about stuff that was covered in freshman year of computer science. Uh, and that's kind of BS if you went through uh, CS undergrad, and more so if you never did and you're just coming to programming. Um, one of those things is recursion, which, uh, a lot of people find really intimidating or just really like a scary advanced topic. And actually, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, I started doing some research into like what difficulty do people have with recursion. Mostly this is just Googling for the phrase, recursion is hard. And then finding people who are posting this into forums and then trying to figure out where they're going wrong. And I, I found out several things about how computer science professors and computer science textbooks usually teach recursion. Um, and I feel like I've kind of boiled away a lot of that. Um, so this is a beginner's guide to tackling recursion. Um, I'm Al Swigert. This is my Twitter handle. Uh, if you go to bit.ly slash pyohio2018 recursion, you will find this website right here. Um, and I have a little form, uh, a little link right here that says handout form. And this is just to add something uh, We'll, we'll go over the answers together so you don't actually have to answer this, but as I'm, uh, I'll point out as I cover the answer to all of these basic questions, and I kind of figured like this is sort of really simple single sentences that you can just sort of memorize the answers to just to like keep track of how you're going uh, through this tutorial. And the filled out form is right here, so that's all the answers right there. Uh, and then the slides are also down here, but a lot of this is gonna be me typing live code, what could possibly go wrong. So I'm going to switch back to the slides right here. So that's at bit.ly slash pyohio2018 recursion. And this is a tutorial. I'm going to try to not make this very talky. There's not going to be any moments where we're going to you know, be breaking off into pairs or something and do programming like that. Uh, it's mostly as I type code into the interactive shell, just sort of follow along with me. So you'll develop this muscle memory for what's going on a lot better that way, as opposed to just watching this tutorial. Um, so yeah, first things first, let's get through all of the recursion jokes. Because there's a ton of these. I keep finding them every time I, I Google for recursion. The first of which is, to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. Ha, ha, ha. This gets funnier every time I see it. Another one, uh, dictionary definition, recursion. See also recursion. Uh, yo, dog, I heard you like cars, so we put a car in your car so you can drive while you drive. Uh, oh, no, poo, that's not honey. You're eating recursion over and over and over again. Uh, how to pose like this. Um, <laughs> if you Google for the word recursion, the nerds at Google made it say, did you mean recursion? And you can click on that link, and it'll take you back to the page that you were just on. I like my coffee like I like my coffee, recursive. Uh, one dark, cold night, three men were sitting around a fire. One said, John, tell us a story. And so he began, one dark, cold night, three men were sitting around over and over and over again. 
Uh, there's a, a lot of technologies because that are made by nerdy people who like recursive acronyms. So the programming language PHP stands for PHP Hypertext Preprocessor. Uh, the Wine Windows Emulator stands for Wine is not an emulator, and GNU uh, stands for GNU's not Unix. I'm still not entirely sure what they mean by that. <laughs> uh, I'm so meta, even this acronym is meta. And okay, yeah, so that's all a lot of the jokes. Uh, I'm getting all of those out of our system. This is just Sierpinski's triangle, which is a fractal, which is a self-similar shape. You can easily make these by just drawing a triangle and then drawing an upside down triangle inside of it. And then that forms three other triangles and you can draw upside down triangles in those and repeat that over and over and over again. So what is recursion? Um, you know, just from looking at these jokes, it's sort of like, well, it, it like loops infinitely and it's kind of meta and it's, it's self-referential or something like that. And, and a basic definition is uh, a recursive thing is something that is defined in terms of itself. So the Sierpinski triangle is a triangle with an upside down triangle inside of it and three more Sierpinski triangles inside of those smaller triangles. And then you just repeat that over and over and over again. Let's see, I have my talking notes right here. Um, as far as programming goes, I'm gonna switch over to my favorite IDE of all time, Idle. Uh, so this is the interactive shell, and you can follow along uh, with me. As far as programming goes, a recursion is when a function calls itself. So here's the shortest example possible of recursion. I'm going to define a function right here. And all this function does is call itself. So that's great. We can just call this function and kick it off and see what happens and it causes an error and crashes the program. That's great, this is recursion. Um, this is actually uh, what's called a stack overflow. You'll find this um, error message right here, recursion error, maximum recursion depth exceeded, also known as a stack overflow, which is where the uh, website gets its name, stackoverflow.com. Oh right, and also because this is a tutorial and not a talk, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask me any questions as you have them. Uh, Oh, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, let me see. So move this right here. And well, actually, I'll need to shrink this down. There we go. OK. So right, um, for those who didn't see, so we have def shortest, and all it does is call itself, uh, and then we call that to get this stack overflow. So if there's ever a time where I'm moving way too fast with the code examples, I'll try to leave them on the screen for as long as possible, but just go ahead and uh, raise your hand and ask me to slow down. Um, so going back to that joke, to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. I really hate that joke, mostly because it's not true. The first thing you need to understand about recursion it, uh, is understanding stacks. And hey, if we go back to that handout, that's the uh, first thing on here. So to understand recursion, you must first understand stacks. So a stack is just about the simplest data structure that you can have in all of programming. Um, if you imagine a stack of plates or a stack of cards, like right here, I show various states. Uh, here on the left, the stack starts off empty and we start putting things on top of this stack. So we have like the five of diamonds, and then we put the three of clubs on top of the five of diamonds, then we put the ace of hearts on top of that, and then we remove the ace of hearts uh, to reveal the three of clubs underneath that. So a stack is a data structure where you only add or remove objects from the top of the stack. And whenever we add something to the top of a stack, we call that pushing uh, data onto the stack, and when we remove it, we call that popping data off of the stack. Um, in the most simplest implementations of a stack, we're only dealing with the uh, top of the stack, and we also don't even know how many items are on the stack. We only know if it's empty or not. So if we go back to that handout, you can see number two. So in a stack data structure, you can only add or remove from the top of the stack. Um, top really means sort of the end. I mean, when we look at this, like the cards are on top, 
but depending on how you're just visualizing this, um, there's just one side uh, that you're always adding and removing items from. And also uh, for number three, the term for adding to a stack is pushing, while removing from a stack is popping. Now we can use a Python list to implement a stack. So I'm going to go back to the interactive shell right here. And a Python list gives us everything we need to implement a stack. Actually, it gives us more than what we need. We only need a little bit of a Python list functionality. So I'm just going to call a variable right here uh, called stack, set that to an empty list, which will be our empty stack. And the append method will push items onto the stack like so. Let's uh, append, I don't know, uh, five of diamonds, and then stack.append, two of clubs, stack.append, ace of hearts. And if we just look at the stack, we can see, oh, well, that just looks like a list that we're used to dealing with. Notice that we're always adding things, in this case, to the right. There's one end that we're always adding and removing objects from. Uh, so the end of the list is sort of the top of our stack. And then if we want to pop items off of the stack, Python helpfully has a pop method, which will return that topmost item. And then if we look at the stack again, we'll notice it has been removed from the top of the stack. So that's append and pop. If we go back to our handout, here on uh, part four, Python lists can be used as a stack with the append method for pushing and the pop method for popping. Uh, why, they, why they didn't just go with push and pop for the names? Hmm, ask, uh, ask Ido, I guess, if you ever run into him. Now, the reason this is uh, going to be used in recursion is because it's also used uh, by functions uh, to keep track of where a Python needs to return to. So um, a way that you can, you can describe it is, if you ever think of your web browser, whenever you click on a link, you are pushing a web page to the uh, browser's history. Uh, so as you click on links, you're sort of pushing web pages onto its stack. And then when you hit the back button, you're popping links off of the stack. And the browser is only going to show the very top of this stack, that web page that you're looking at currently. Um, pretend that web, uh, web browsers didn't have a forward button uh, so that you could just click on links and then go back. That's also a stack-like uh, behavior. So um, we have to understand stacks, and we also have to understand uh, function calls. So I'm going to open up a brand new file editor so I can run some programs here. Let me adjust these windows so that it looks OK. All right, and let's just uh, do some more really basic things. You don't have to know a lot of Python programming to be able to follow along and understand recursion. Let's create a function called a that calls another function called b, which calls another function called c. So it's going to basically look like this. Uh, define a. All it does is call b. Let's uh, create b. All that is going to do is call C, and then call C. And um, I don't know, let's just have this say, uh, this is the start of C. And let's just also say this is the end of C. Let's add these print messages to the start and end of the other two functions as well. And don't forget uh, to kick all of this off. We're going to have to just call A at the very end of it. So we've defined these three functions. All they do is call the next function. And try to think about it a little bit about what you think the output of this is going to be. Or you know, just run the program and figure it out. Uh, so when you run this, you'll see the uh, start of A, start of B, start of C. And then it happens in reverse order end of C, end of B, end of A. Uh, 
That makes a lot of sense, but we can use this one tool, which is really great. I'm going to select all of this and hit Copy. And I'm going to go to my web browser. I'm going to go to this website, pythontutor.com. How many people have used this website before? Uh, show of hands. Oh, this is great. I get to introduce a lot of people to this website. Uh, this is a great uh, debugging tool for small snippets of code. Um, you can just click on Visualize Your Code. And then I'm just going to paste everything right here. And then hit Visualize Execution. So it runs our code, uh, and then it records every single step of, this ex of running this program. And so sort of like a debugger, it lets you step line by line through what's happening. And it shows you the state of all the variables. Here we're defining all these functions. And you can see once we reach here, we call the A function. And so that moves the execution back to the very start of A. You can see the red arrow shows you where the execution currently is. This sort of lighter colored arrow shows you where it came from. Um, but not only that, uh, we can also hit the back button. It's just a recording of the execution of this program. So we can sort of see the, the state of this program at every single point and just go back and forth. We can see the output right here, start of A, B, C, and then C, B, A. So I'm going to go click back real quick, and I'm going to make a slight change to this. I'm just going to add some local variables named spam right here. And we can make these whatever value we want. Uh, so spam equals 42, and spam equals hello, uh, spam equals true. Um, just put a different spam variable in there, and then hit visualize execution again. It'll run our program and return the recording of this. And you see the first few steps are just defining our functions, and then we call A, which brings us here. And now we print out start of A, and we save this variable, spam equals 42. And then we call B. And now we go, uh, this also has a spam variable, spam equals hello. And we can all see that right here. There's a, uh, a local spam variable right here, and then uh, set to 42, which is what it was in A, and then hello, which is what it was in B. Let's click a few more times and get this. So uh, calling functions isn't sort of a one-way trip for the execution. Um, it's sort of easy to think of it as that, like, oh, I'm going to call a function, then we start running all the code inside that function. But remember, it, Python will eventually come back to the line that called it. So when we're done with C, Python doesn't just jump to the end of the program. It goes back to the line uh, that called it and then continues on from there. So it remembers that, oh, uh, I C was called from B right here. Um, and then when this returns, that goes back to A. I'm going to go back to when we were in the middle of C right here. So calling functions, just like your browser where you're clicking on links and then hitting the back button, uh, calling functions also involves a stack. And this is called the call stack. Um, this is how we remember, this is how Python remembers where to return to whenever your function calls uh, return. So we go back to that little handout right here. I think that's, uh, what, number five. Function calls make use of a stack called the call stack. And we can sort of see like this stack-like structure right here. In this case, the stack grows downward just because of the way that this is visualizing this. And we can see there's sort of a, a thing called frames right here. And it shows the global frame. And then there's a frame for A and a frame for B and a frame for C. So what goes on the call stack are frame objects. And frame objects contain, one, the return address for where it should return after it's done with that function call. And two, it also stores all of the local variables. So even though we have uh, all of these variables are named spam. We know that these are local uh, variables. They're local to the function. And we can see right here, like, oh, there's this spam is different from this spam, and it's different from this spam. And whenever we need to return, the call stack will remember, like, oh, when C returns, we have to return to B. And so it's popping off that frame object and returning to B. So the top of the stack, or I guess the bottom of the stack right here, the end of the stack, I guess, uh, is the function call that we're currently in, where the execution is, where this red arrow is. And so we can see 
as we return from these function calls, we pop off more and more of these until finally we're back here at the global scope, which is what has these identifiers, these names A, B, and C for the functions. And then we're at the very end of the program and it stops. So uh, if you've ever wondered sort of like how local variables work or how we, you know, how Python keeps track of all of these local variables, even if they have the same name, just remember that uh, these local variables are created whenever a function is called and they exist on the call stack in these frame objects. Um, so a lot of everything of what I've had to say is like sort of really basic Python things, but it's sort of easy to take for granted because we don't really think of the call stack when we're writing programs. We just know like, oh, Python's just gonna return back to where it came from. It just handles all of that. Um, but explicitly thinking about the call stack is what can really make recursion start to make sense. Because if you think about it, the call stack is this stack-like data structure, but it doesn't exist inside any variable in our program. It's this completely invisible thing. You can't point to the source code and say, this is where the call stack is. It's this thing that's out of sight, and therefore it's out of mind, and you don't really think about it that often. And this is a critical mistake when you're dealing with recursion, where you have a function calling itself. Um, that be, turns out to be a, a major part of recursion, and sort of glossing over this is the main mistake that a lot of computer science professors and textbooks make when they're explaining recursion. And if we go back to that handout, I think we uh, answered a couple more of these. Number six, the call stack pushes frame objects uh, when functions are called and pops them when functions return. And number seven, uh, frame objects contain the return address, just basically where, what line of code it should return to in your program, and also uh, local variables for a function call. And that's another thing to keep in mind, is that these local variables, we tend to say that they're local to a function, but really they're local to a function call, a particular call of that function. It's just that most of the time, we're not calling the same function over and over and over again. Um, uh, so it doesn't really matter, we can sort of, it's, Thinking of, as it, as, uh, thinking of it as local to the function is the same as thinking of it as local to the function call, but that changes with recursion. Um, yeah, so this website, pythontutor.com, really great. Uh, I think we're actually, now we can go into actual recursion. So keep all of this in mind. We have call stacks, which are a stack data structure. They contain frame objects. Frame objects hold all the local variables and the return address. Uh, and also, because these frame objects use up memory, like it takes up memory when you're remembering, okay, return here for A and B and C. Uh, if we have uh, a function that just keeps calling itself nonstop and never returning, kind of what we have in our very first case right here with the shortest function, uh, we're eventually gonna run out of memory because that call stack is gonna keep growing and growing and growing. And to stop it from just eating all of the computer's memory, uh, Python just sort of sets an arbitrary limit of 1,000 data, uh, 1,000 function calls. And then it says, hey, something's wrong here. I'm just gonna raise this exception recursion error uh, and stop your program. You can actually change this around a little bit. Uh, if you import sys, there's a function called set recursion limit, and you can set it uh, even higher, so you know maybe like 2,000. And if we call shortest now, I guess this restarted itself, so define shortest, it calls shortest, and then let's call shortest. Now you can see, um, well, we've, it's showing the uh, traceback right here, which is essentially the call stack well, you know, shortest, and then it called shortest again, and then it called shortest again, and it did this 1,994 times, so that's because our recursion is 2,000. Now, you can't just keep calling uh, sys.set recursion limit on higher and higher values just to escape uh, stack overflows. Usually, when a stack overflow happens, there's some bug or something that's wrong with your program and it keeps making the, these out of control recursion calls. In fact, I'm gonna demonstrate this right here. Uh, sorry that this is so small. Let me try increasing the size 
of this. Let's make this like 28 point. I'm going to launch Python uh, from the command line right here. Let's see, if we import sys and call sit, sys set recursion limit, now let's just set it to something insanely high. Like that. Oh, okay, not that high. How about that? Um, let's create that, our shortest possible recursive function. And then let's call it. Um, you can't just keep raising the recursion limit. Uh, it's set to 1,000 because that's sort of an arbitrary limit. Uh, maybe you have programs that you know, usually call it like go five or 10 function calls deep, maybe several hundred sometimes. 1,000 seems to be excessive, so I guess that's why they chose that number. But if you set it to some giant <laughs> uh, number, eventually the C runtime for Python is going to crash. So here on Windows, it says you know, python.exe has stopped working. Like This is much worse than raising an exception, because you can always catch those. Uh, this is the program has actually crashed Python and then spat us back out to the terminal. Um, I like to use the metaphor of if you've set up a program to just automatically buy stuff online using your credit card number and there's some problem and it's just constantly buying things online nonstop, the solution to that is to not call up your credit card company and ask them to raise your credit limit. Uh, there's some other problem that you need to fix there. So those are all the ways that uh, recursion can really go wrong. Uh, we have a call stack. It uses up memory. Um, this stack overflow happens when you have a recursive function that's calling itself nonstop. So if you want to actually do something useful with recursion, you're going to have to add something that makes the recursive function stop calling itself. And this is called a base case. Let's see. Um, Let's go up and uh, create our shortest function right here. Um, so this is not going to work. But maybe if we just set up a global variable, uh, spam equals 0. And then here we can say, well, let's use this global variable spam and always just increase it by 1 each time. Um, the base case is simply just, it can be as simple as an if statement, uh, but it's some circumstance where you stop making recursive function calls. So let's say if spam equals 100, we're just going to return. Otherwise, we can do our recursive function. So this is our base case. And alternatively, um, the part where we, the case, the circumstances where we make a recursive function call is called our recursive case. So now when we uh, call, uh, run this program, it's going to end up making about 100 uh, recursive function calls before it hits the base case. That is, if I've programmed this correctly, I'm going to run this. And it does absolutely nothing. That's great. It didn't crash. Um, maybe let's just add some output right here by saying print spam. And we can see once it reached 100, the base case became true, and so it just returned, which then uh, returned back to the previous time that it was called. So this is sort of a kind of hard to reason. It's easy to think, oh, it's returning back here. But remember, there are several frame objects, one for each function, uh, recursive function call that was made uh, right here. And it has to return through all of those first. Let me just uh, shrink this down a little bit. Let's say uh, four. And then I'm going to select all and copy and then paste this into Python Tutor. Dot com. I love this website so much. Uh, let's hit Visualize Execution. And it's run our complete program. There's uh, 27 steps right here. And we see, OK, it's uh, created this global spam variable right here and set it to 0. And now we're going to call the shortest function. So spam right here the, in the global frame, because it's, we're dealing with the global spam variable. That's what we meant when we ran global spam right here. We print that out, and then it checks uh, if it's the base case, it's not, so it recursively calls itself. So now we have that call as shortest, so we have a frame object for shortest, and now we have a second uh, frame object for shortest. We do this again and again. And then finally, so we have all of these frame objects, one for each function call. 
finally we hit that base case, and then we start returning. But we don't return all the way down here to line 12. Remember, this pops off. Shortest remembers that, oh, I was called by, well, shortest. So it returns back here to line 10. And then this moves forward. Of course, there's nothing else at the end of this function. So it returns back to what called it, which was also line 10. And then that returns to what called it, which was also line 10. And it keeps popping off these frame objects until finally it returns back to line 12, the very first call that we made. And you can see all those frame objects are gone because we've returned from all of these uh, function calls. So let's go back to the handout. Um, uh, so every single uh, recursive function call that you have, your recursive function needs to have at least one base case and at least one recursive case. If it doesn't have a base case, it's going to stack overflow because it's never going to stop calling itself. And if it doesn't have at least one recursive case, it's not really a recursive function because it's not calling itself. So we go back to this handout. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> number eight, the sys set recursion limit function can change the maximum recursion depth. depth. The times that it's appropriate to call this is never. Um, essentially, if you find yourself calling that function, uh, you're, you almost certainly are, are just sort of putting off uh, the real bug that's causing that stack overflow. Um, and number nine, recursive functions must always have at least one base case and at least one recursive case. So recursion is kind of like this sort of mystical thing because a lot of times people aren't even thinking about call stacks or frame objects. It just seems to either work magically, um, which is a really poor way of going about thinking about it because you're not truly understanding what's happening. Um, and recursion has because it's seen as this advanced computer science topic, a lot of people think of it as, uh, I don't know, a wizardry or of something, or like it's a powerful programming technique. Actually, you really don't need to use recursion. It's fine just to use a loop and a stack. That's all you need to, uh, that's the only things you need in order to re uh, replicate everything recursion is doing. Because that's essentially what we're doing right here. Uh, this function is effectively our loop that's going back and forth. Uh, starting over and over again at the beginning each time we do a recursive function call. And the stack is just the call stack. Uh, we could just use a Python list for a stack and then a loop to have that behavior of starting over again at the start of some block of code. So really, um, let's see. We go back to our handout here. Um, this is also often called iteration. So you'll often see iteration used uh, in the same sentence as recursion. People, like an interviewer will say like, okay, write the iterative solution for this, and now write the recursive solution for it. Iterative basically just means it's using a loop. Um, I actually sort of prefer iteration over recursion most of the, most of the time. Uh, recursion, I don't know, there's like 5% of the population that just has that type of brain where they look at re recursive algorithms like, oh, this makes so much sense. It's so elegant. And for the rest of people, it's just confusing and, and mystifying. Um, uh, one plus side, though, is about iterative algorithms is that they'll never stack overflow. That's the answer for number 11 uh, on the handout. Uh, they'll never stack overflow because they never have a stack. Um, or, or if you do have a stack and implementing it with, say, like a Python list, a Python list can contain much more than just a thousand items in the list. You know, you can just eat up gigabytes of memory with that. Um, so really, recursion and iteration are equally powerful. There is literally nothing that you can do with recursion that you can't do uh, with iteration. And iteration, if we just look at line 12 right here, um, there's nothing that recursion can do that you can't do without, uh, that you can't do with a loop and a stack. Uh, yeah? Can you handle stack overflow? Uh, yes. And in fact, I'll just show this uh, right now because it's just, remember, it's an exception just like any other thing in Python. Let's do that shortest example right here and then have a try. Uh, let's try calling shortest and accept. To say it crashed. And now we call shortest. 
and say, well, it crashed. <laughs> um, let's actually make this a little bit nicer looking. How about let's uh, have that same uh, global spam, spam plus equals one, print spam. I think this is going to work, and then I'll have spam equals zero, and then call shortest. Oh yeah, the thing about printing out output is it will really slow down your program. Um, but you can see like, oh, you, know, you can make about a thousand function calls. I think idle is eating up some of these function calls right here. So we got to 979 before finally it raised that maximum recursion depth exceeded exception. But we can catch that just like any other Python exception. And then I'll just say, well, it crashed. Um, and then it actually returns. That's sort of our base case, because after it printed out, it crashed. It just continued with the rest of the function. Well, it reached the end of the function, so it returned. And then all of those other function calls also returned over and over and over again. Let's see. OK. All right, now I'm going to move on to the classic recursion examples. If you've gone through CS undergrad, you've probably looked at these two problems. and. They're actually, uh, they're like the canonical recursive algorithm uh, examples that are taught to everybody learning recursion, which is too bad because they're also kind of terrible, and I'll explain why. And these are factorial and Fibonacci. Okay, so factorial, um, you know, it's often written with an exclamation mark, uh, five exclamation mark. This is really just the same thing as five times four times three times two times one. And so that's 120. So 5 factorial is 120. Uh, 6 factorial is just 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So that's 720. Um, it's really easy to write a, a loop that can handle this. Let me do this. Uh, let me line up my windows right here. Let's just erase this. Um, yeah, we can just create a, a loop that can do this. I'll just call this uh, fac. Fact. We'll just call it num. Um, and you know, down here, uh, we'll just assert that factorial uh, like 5 is 120. In fact, we can just print out factorial 5 right here. So we want that to be 120. This is really easy. We can start off with uh, maybe like product equals 1, and then just have a for loop that goes over uh, num times. Um, you know, actually, I guess this is instead of doing five times four times three times two times one, it'll just be one times two times three times four times five. So I guess really we want this to start at one and then go up to, but not including num plus one, so it includes num, and then this will just be um, multiply the product by i, and then return the product. This is kind of a very straightforward way of calculating this. If we run this. Uh, it spits out 120. Um, I'm going to copy and paste all of this and put it into pythontutor.com. Sorry for taking away the code. So here it is. We put visualize execution. You can see it right here. This is a pretty standard loop. And as you can see, the product is increasing as we multiply it by 3, then multiply it by 4, then multiply it by 5. And then it just returns that. Uh, 120 for 5. So this is a very straightforward code. This code is easy to understand. You can look at it and say, oh, yes, I know what's going on. Let's make this more difficult by doing the recursive solution. This is the part of the coding interview where your interviewer says, now give me the recursive algorithm for factorial. Um, and so let's think about uh, the definition of recursion. It's when something is defined in terms of itself. Uh, if you look at these two examples of 5 factorial and 6 factorial, you can see that 6 factorial is really just the number 6 times, well, it looks like 5 factorial. So if you want to calculate the factorial of some number in, you just need to multiply in times the factorial of in minus 1. So in order to understand factorial, you have to understand factorial. And they're like, oh, okay, well, what's 5 factorial? Well, 5 factorial is just 5 times 4 factorial, and 4 factorial is just 4 times 3 factorial, and over and over and over again. So let's take our beautiful factorial function right here, 
and just make it incredibly hard to understand. Um, <laughs> so here, whenever we're starting off with a recursive function, remember, recursive functions need at least one base case and at least one recursive case. Yes, perfect. Sorry, I didn't tell everyone I'll be doing like call and response thing, uh, but uh, I'll just try to like hint at that. But yes, okay, so we need, um, you know, like an if something, uh, and that'll be our base case, and we'll probably return something, uh, or else we have a recursive case. And then, uh, well, we, we need to uh, do a recursive function call, and, and I guess we'll do like something here. So remember, okay, this is a good way to start off. We always need at least one base case. We always need at least one recursive case. Uh, the base case is when we stop uh, making more recursive calls. And usually in recursive algorithms, it's usually the simplest case. So hey, let's do one factorial. One factorial is one times well, really, nothing. One factorial is just one. So this is pretty simple. Uh, finally, we're not defining factorial in terms of factorial. So that's a pretty good base case. We can just replace this and say, hey, uh, if num is equal to one, let's just return one. So uh, this is great. Um, this will actually work, I think, as long as we only call one. Hey, perfect. <laughs> Um, this is sort of a lousy factorial function so far, but it works for at least one case. Um, otherwise, we need to call uh, factorial again and then return something like that. So what if it was factorial two? Well, that would be, I guess, uh, two times factorial one, except we're not just doing you know, factorial two, we're doing factorial of any number, num. So we'd have to change this to be, uh, I guess, num times uh, factorial num minus one. And then we can run this. Yep, that one case still works. Let's try five and seven, or uh, and six. So when we run this code, we can see, hey, it spits out the correct answer. So this is a recursive function. Of course, if you look at this, um, this is when I was Googling for people saying uh, recursion is hard or I don't understand recursion. I would Google for literally those phrases to find people talking about this. And I found one person saying, okay, I get the base case. Factorial of one is one. That makes sense. Um, but I really don't understand this recursive case. I mean, when we're talking about factorial, we're talking about like five times four times three times two times one. Where does all of this multiplication happen here? Um, and they didn't really understand. And so I discovered another thing about recursion that computer science professors and textbooks rarely ever talk about, is that you can have things happening before and after the recursive call. Uh, in this case, there's stuff happening before and after the recursive call all on the same line. So half of this line gets executed, this like num times, and then it uh, figures out what num minus one is, and then it makes the uh, recursive function call and then yeah, that keeps making other rec recursive function calls. Eventually it comes back, and then it finishes the other half where it does the full multiplication and then returning that. Um, if you think back to, oh nuts, I already got rid of all of it. Our case where we had, uh, a calling B. Calling C. This is C, this is C, this is B, this is B. When we had this, remember what the output was for this. I think this is all correct, so I'll hit visualize execution. When we got to the very end of this, Oh, haha, I forgot to actually do that first call. When we got to the very end of all of this code, we can see, oh, we had start of A, start of B, start of C. All of this is starting, uh, this is the output that's coming from these print statements before 
the, uh, the next function call. And then there's stuff that's happening after that function call. So before b is called here in a, we print out start of a, and then a whole bunch of other stuff is happening. And then finally, we return back here from b, and it prints end of a at the very end. And that's why it's giving us this sort of reverse output here at the end. It's the same thing for our factorial function. In fact, let me go ahead and just copy and paste this into Python Tutor. So we've defined our function. We're calling factorial 5. And then we can see, hey, uh, we need to run this. And in order to run this, you know, we have, um, we have num right here. That's set to 5. And now we're calling factorial again. This time, we're passing 4, num minus 1. So remember, local variables are local to function calls and not to functions. And that becomes more obvious when we only have one function that we're doing recursive calls over and over and over again. So you know, you only see, when you're just looking at the source code, you only see, oh, this local variable num. It's easy to forget that there are multiple local variables num uh, one for each function call. These are because local variables are local to function calls and not just to the function. So here we call it again. That's three, now two. And then finally we get to this base case where num is one. So the base case is now true. So this is going to return one. So this frame object has a return value of one. It's just returning that. And then it goes back to the line that calls it. Um, so this is 1, but num is right here. Num is 2. So this is 2 times 1. And so the return value of this frame object is 2. And then when we return back to the previous recursive call, um, 3 times 2 is 6. So the return value of this, remember num is 3, and then the uh, return from this was 2. So 3 times 2 is 6. So this is going to return 6. I click forward again. Um, Num here is 4. That return value is 6, so 4 times 6 is 24. And then it keeps going back. So all of the uh, multiplications that happen here, when we have 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, we only see one multiplication symbol in our source code. But that's because uh, that one multiplication is happening over and over and over again for each function call, for each frame object on the call stack. Until finally, it just returns. 120, which is what we print out right here. Um, this code is terrible, actually. And it would never pass code review, and I would never check this code in. Um, because, well, I don't know. Let's see what happens when we call factorial 1009. I don't know, just a little bit larger than 1000. It's just an arbitrary number that I chose for no reason whatsoever. Uh, oh, right. Maximum recursion depth exceeded. In comparison, <laughs> right. So it's yet another, and we can see the entire call stack right here. And it says, oh, this is repeated 989 more times. So really, this error message is several pages long. Um, oh, right. Well, it turns out our elegant recursive algorithm for calculating factorials uh, can't handle anything above like factorial 1,000 or so, because it'll stack overflow. Um, I mean, if we go back, I can just write up that uh, iterative version real quick. I don't know, product equals 1 for uh, i in range 1 to num plus 1. Uh, product, what was it? Times equals i, and we just return i. Was that it? I think so. A what? Oh, right, ha ha. Thanks. Was that right? Yeah, 120. OK, let's do 1,009. Yeah, that's easy. It's <laughs> the iterative version, uh, you know, it's a, factorials are pretty big numbers. But it took about like a millisecond to execute, whereas a recursive uh, function couldn't handle it. Now, this is where most computer science professors would go into something called tail call elimination, which I'm going to push off uh, until the end of this tutorial. But uh, let's go into the, the next thing. I think uh, if we go back to that handout, uh, yeah, so number 13, the recursive factorial solution can be confusing because code is run 
before and after the recursive call. And it's easy to forget that things happen uh, after the recursive call, especially after the recursive call, because usually you think of like, oh, it's just making the recursive call, and then magic happens, and then it, it figures out the answer. Um, always remember that stuff happens after the recursive call as well. And the recursive factorial solution isn't used in real world code because calculating large factorials results in a stack overflow. Um, let's move on to Fibonacci numbers. Uh, just in case you don't remember this, Fibonacci numbers, uh, it's a sequence of numbers. The first two numbers in the sequence are defined as one and one, or maybe sometimes it's zero and one. Uh, let's just go with one and one. Let me just zoom in a little bit right here. So the next number in the sequence, uh, in the Fibonacci sequence, is just the previous two numbers added together. So if you have one and one, the next number is two, and then uh, the next number in the sequence is one plus two, which is three, and the next number in the sequence is two plus three, which is five, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, if you want to write an iterative uh, solution to this, it's pretty simple. Uh, you just have two variables, A and B, that keep track of the last two numbers. You can start them off both as one. Um, and the next value of the next value of A is just going to be the old value of B, and the next value of B is just going to be the old value of A plus B, and then you just calculate the next A plus B right there, and then you can just keep doing that over and over and over again. Let me just go ahead and live code uh, an example of this. So fib for num, uh, let's just have A and B equals one and one. And then for i in range, I'm probably going to have an off by one error with this, uh, so just bear with me. So a and b, the next a and b should be uh, what? b is going to be, the old b value is the new a value, and a plus b is going to be the new b, uh, b value right there. And we can return b. I think this is probably not right, <laughs> because I think we actually might want to do minus two because uh, the Fibonacci value, let me just run this real quick and see what the interactive shell says. So the first two numbers should just be one and one, and then Fibonacci three, the third Fibonacci number should just be one plus one, which is two, and the fourth Fibonacci number should just be three. Yeah, so this seems to work out just fine. Uh, and then we can just say, like, hey, uh, I don't know, 1,009. And that's a pretty big number, but, you know, it takes, like, a millisecond to run. This is a very simple iterative algorithm for calculating Fibonacci numbers. Um, I forget, this, it's one of those math things that shows, uh, shows up everywhere. Uh, originally, I think Fibonacci, the Italian mathematician, uh, let's edit this video so if he's not Italian, I said the correct thing. Um, so uh, the mathematician uh, Fibonacci, I think, used it to model like rabbit populations growing. Um, but it shows up in all sorts of natural phenomena as well. Uh, and this is the part where the coding interview says, OK, now write the recursive example of this. And then you're like, ah, OK, so recursion. It's defining something in terms of itself. I mean, really, the third Fibonacci number is just the second Fibonacci number and the first Fibonacci number added together. And the fourth Fibonacci number, whoops. And the fourth Fibonacci number is really just the third and the second Fibonacci number added together. I mean, if you look at this, um, okay, whichever, uh, oh, let me find this one. Here we have the first Fibonacci number, second, it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. So if we wanted to calculate, say, the fifth Fibonacci number, well, that's just going to be the fourth Fibonacci number and the third Fibonacci added together. And if we wanted to calculate the sixth Fibonacci number, that's just the fifth and the fourth. So really, if we want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, we just need to add the n minus 1 Fibonacci number to the n minus 2 Fibonacci number. like this. 
So this is our recursive case right here. It's uh, Fibonacci defined in terms of itself. And then we also have the base cases because once we get over to the first and second, we can just define those as one. So looking at this, we can start, uh, start writing our own recursive example of this. Um, you know, okay, let's do this. Uh, if something, then we have the base case, else something else, we have our recursive case. So for our base case, uh, in, for this algorithm, we actually have two base cases. Remember, we always have at least one base case and at least one recursive case. So if num is one, we want to return one. And if num is two, we also want to return one. Um, you know, you can consider this to be two base cases, but it might just be easier to just say, oh, well, if num equals one or num equals two right here. That's a lot simpler. Um, otherwise, well, okay, it's a recursive case. That means we call our function, so we're probably gonna return fib something. If we look back at our example, the nth Fibonacci number is just the sum of n minus one and n minus two. So here we can just say return Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n minus two. So I'm going to run this code. try to keep that source code up there on the screen. Uh, be really careful about this. Um, so, you know, we could run Fibonacci one and two, and that seems to work, and four, and five, and maybe the 10th Fibonacci number, and maybe the 15th Fibonacci number, about 25th Fibonacci number. Yeah, this seems to be working out well. Let's go up to like the uh, 30th Fibonacci number. How about the 50th Fibonacci number? Um, yeah, it'll, it'll eventually get there. So there's a problem with this. Fibonacci is one of the basic examples of recursion, uh, and it's also terrible, just like how factorial is terrible. And I'm gonna have to just hit Control C to kill this. Uh, if I did like 35, this will take several seconds and that eventually ends. Um, let's go back to our algorithm right here. So every time we call Fibonacci, it's gonna end up calling two other calls to Fibonacci, and each of these calls is going to make two calls to Fibonacci, and each of those calls are gonna make two. So you end up with this exponentially uh, growing amount of function calls for the Fibonacci sequence. Um, oh, where is the example image that I had for this? Let me find this. Uh, let me just do a Google search for it. we look at the growth of Fibonacci. Here we go, we can have an example like this. Um, zoom in. So when we call Fibonacci five, that's calling Fibonacci three and four and those are making two other calls, and those are making two other calls, and it eventually stops when you hit the base cases, in this case, one and zero. Um, but there's a problem here. Notice that uh, we're making several calls to Fibonacci three. Like, we're calling Fibonacci three here, but we also call it here when we're calculating Fibonacci four. And we're making several calls to Fibonacci two. We're doing it here, and here, and here. Uh, we're doing a lot of the same calculation over and over and over again. And there's another trick around this, just like how uh, working around uh, stack overflows was tail call elimination. Here we can do memoization, which is another big thing in, in functional programming, which makes use of a lot of recursion. But uh, to me, it just seems like a really ugly hack. Like, if you want to calculate Fibonacci numbers, if that is your goal, recursion, uh, even though it's a classic recursion example, recursion is not something you want to do as a matter of practicality. Um, so let me go into how we can fix this. 
Fibonacci. So here is my original call to, uh, here's another implementation that I made. You have to adjust this window. So you can see right here, we have Fibonacci nth number, the base case, if it's zero or one, we return one. Otherwise, we're getting this number, um, the nth minus one, and also adding it to nth minus two, um, and then returning that result. Uh, you can see this ends up making a lot of repeated calls. Uh, so, you know, call to Fibonacci 3, we see that over and over and over again. So the way to fix this is essentially by creating a cache. Like, Fibonacci is a deterministic function. Whenever we uh, pass, like, the number 5 to Fibonacci, it's always going to return the same number. There's no uh, randomness involved in this. So we could create something like Fibonacci cache, which we'll just implement as a global variable that has a dictionary. Um, and every time uh, we find that we've called Fibonacci and the argument that we've passed in exists in our cache, we'll just return that cached number. And we'll populate this cache by uh, otherwise, every time we do the actual calculation, we'll go ahead and store the return value in the cache uh, with, whatever parameter, with whatever argument we pass to it before returning the actual value. So here, before we return the result for the recursive case, we're going to store it in our cache. And so this has all the same debug output as the original version. You can see call to Fibonacci and returning, et cetera. Except now, when we run this, calculating Fibonacci 10, it's a lot shorter. Here's the original call, all of this output for all of those function calls. And here, it's a lot shorter. And this is because we've uh, cached all of these results. And this is also called memoization. Uh, and memoization essentially just makes recur a lot of recursion practically possible. Um, so if you are in that 5% of the population, you just really love alg uh, recursive algorithms, but uh, it doesn't actually work in practical reality, you can use memoization as a hack to uh, make it actually workable on real world computers. And then you can say, ah, yes, Fibonacci, that is simply uh, has a base case of uh, one and two returning one and then returning Fibonacci in minus one plus Fibonacci in minus two. Um, your coworkers will still hate you for using the recursive algorithm, but you can do it. Um, uh, the other one, tail call elimination, I'll go into uh, later on. Um, but uh, at this point, I just kind of want to start talking about, uh, well, okay, what is recursion good for? I've, I've kind of said recursion is overrated and it's confusing, but recursion itself maps to problems really well. Uh, I discovered there's sort of two criteria that you want to look for, and that's when your problem involves tree-like data structures and also uh, requires some form of backtracking, like you have to remember how you got there. Um, the, the most practical example of this is uh, having a binary tree and you want to do depth first search. So a binary tree, just writing really simple code, um, don't worry if you don't understand classes uh, in Python. It's, it's, I'm not really going to go that deep into this, but say we have a class and this will be a node in our tree. Um, here's our initializer. We just want to have uh, self dot left. Oh, let me also just. We have a left child and a right child. And we can just say self dot left equals left and self dot right equals right. And uh, we can just start off with. We'll just create a node called and store it in A, and then we can just say, hey, A's left will also be another node. And because A's left child is also a node which has left and right as we've defined it, we can say, hey, A's left child will also have a left child. We'll make that another node. And then we can say that uh, A's left child's left child's left child's. I guess it's great grand left child can also be another node. And we can also say, you know, left and left and its right child will be another node. Uh, this forms a tree-like da tree data structure. It's a lot easier to visualize um, with a picture, which is why I have this picture right here. So imagine if uh, we just called this top node the root node f. 
you know, they call it a tree data structure, even though whenever we draw it out, we're always drawing out downwards. So the root node is at the very top, and it's going to, yeah. Anyway, so it has left, each node has a left and right child. And so in this case, F has children B and G. B has children A and D. Uh, a has no children, so it just ends. Uh, this is a recursive data structure because you can sort of define it in terms of itself. So a tree has nodes that have left and right children that are also nodes. Uh, so those children's nodes will also have children uh, that are nodes, and so on and so on. And if we want to search the entire tree, uh, we can do it two ways. We can do a depth-first uh, traversal or a uh, breadth-first traversal. Um, Depth-first is when we start going down until we can't go down anymore. Then we backtrack a little bit and go back up and then start exploring the other child's nodes. It basically looks like this. You can follow, uh, we start right here. We go, we say, hey, we're looking at F. Now let's look at F's left child. We'll always look at the left child and then the right child for each of these nodes. Um, and then we do the same thing with the B, uh, B node. We'll look at its left child and then its right child. So the part that comes after the recursive function call when we're searching is going to be the part uh, where we search the right child. So we finally get down here to A. A has no children, so we're not going to uh, do any more searching. We'll just pop and go back up the stack sort of back to B, and then uh, we'll continue on with the right child. And then we'll look at its left, and then its right. And so you can see this line is doing a depth first uh, tree traversal. It's always going as deep as it can each time, and only going back up when it's reached the end. So now we go back here to the right, and it keeps going down, and then it'll finally go all the way back up. And once it gets back to the original root node, after searching its right, after searching its right child, we know that we've reached the end. So this is a time where, hey, if you wanted to write some code that could search any arbitrary tree with any arbitrary depth or shape, uh, a recursive example would be pretty good. Um, you know, the, the number of nodes doubles at each level. So as we go down, we're you know, uh, having an exponential amount of possible uh, nodes that we're looking at. So it's really unlikely that we're going to have 1,000 nodes going all the way down. So we're unlikely to hit a stack overflow. Um, so something, uh, something that's completely analogous, this has a tree-like data structure and it also involves backtracking. Something that's like that is uh, walking through a directory tree. So let me just open up the Explorer right here. I'm going to go to my desktop. So on my desktop, I have a whole bunch of files. Uh, I have one called living things, and it's sort of just uh, uh, in a animal tree, or a tree of different organisms. So we can go to like eukaryotic uh, living things, and go to vertebrates, maybe mammals, uh, primates, uh, apes, humans. And in here I have a, a spam.txt file. Now let's say, let's go all the way back to living things. Let's say like, oh, find where spam.txt is somewhere in this massive tree of folders. Uh, this is a pretty good job for a recursive function. There's a tree-like data structure. It also uh, involves backtracking because let's say, let's explore prokaryotic and uh, E. coli, and then we reach the end. So then I want to go back, and then I want to go down here for strep. Nope, uh, spam.txt isn't in there. And I go into the other one, and that's how I can explore all of these. Eventually, I'm going to find that's that file that I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and write this recursively. And I'm probably going to cheat because uh, I might not be able to code all of this uh, straight from my head. So let's create a function and just call it contains uh, spam txt. And uh, we'll give it a starting folder to look at. It's going to look in this folder for spam.txt. Uh, and if it can't find it in that folder, it will look into all the folders in that folder as well. So remember, we have uh, we need a base case and a recursive case. So our base case will be something, you know, if something, this is our base case, we'll probably return something. Let's just get the skeleton for this done. So uh, otherwise we have our recursive case. And that does uh, probably returns something else.
Uh, and then finally, I want to print um, contain spam. And let me go ahead and write that folder in. Uh, what? So on my machine, this is going to be c slash users al desktop living things. And I'm just going to have this return true or false, depending on if it's found uh, this file, spam.txt. So the base case seems fairly simple. Um, there's a, a function in the OS uh, module called listdir that will list all of the files that we have. In fact, if I just run this from the interactive shell, you can see it's just a list value, and it has strings of all the files and folders inside uh, this directory. If we want to see what directory that is, it's like, oh, okay, it's uh, the one where Python is installed. I could just copy, and I can pass it in any folder I wanted it to find. So, like, uh, if I just wanted al uh, users slash al. It'll show you that folder. So uh, this is going to return a list value. So let's just say, hey, uh, if spam.txt is in this folder, I guess we should pass folder to this, um, then hey, we found it. We can just return true, I guess. We found it. It's great. Um, we'll just return true. Otherwise, uh, we'll have to check for all of the folders inside uh, this folder. So it seems like we're going to have to get rid of this, maybe. Um, we have os.list folder. And we're going to just want to loop over all the uh, string values inside here. So this is going to be a list of all the file names and folder names inside folder. So let's just say um, name, or yeah, I guess name is fine name in this. And then we want to check, well, this is going to be files and folders. Um, we want to check uh, if name is spam.txt. We can return true here. I guess we'll just look for a file or a folder named spam.txt. Otherwise, we want to check you know, if what we're looking at here, the current name, is the name of a folder. Then we want to explore that folder as well. So there's another function in OS called OSPath. I believe it's isdir. And this will return true if the string we pass it is a folder, and uh, false if it's a file. So if I say, hey, Windows uh, System32, uh, calc.exe, the calculator program, that's false. So here we'll say, um, let's see, if uh, os.path.isdir. And uh, well, we can't just use name because that's just the name, and we can't really do like folder plus name. Um, we need to combine that. So there's another function called join that will join our folder name and the file name right here. <laughs> and this is what we're checking if it's a directory. And if it is a directory, we want to do our, that's our recursive case. In which case, we want to call contains spam.txt on all of this. And then this will return, uh, we want to return whatever that returns. So wow, this is getting really complicated right here. But let's say it goes through all the folders here uh, in this loop, and it still doesn't find it. Well, then I guess at the very end of this, we'll say, hey, I wasn't able to find spam.txt. I'll just return false. Uh, there's one more technical thing we have to do right here, uh, and that's put this in a giant try. <laughs> because it's possible that we'll get some like file permission errors, and that raises an exception. Um, so in that case, if we can't examine that folder, let's just go ahead and return false. 
Um, so if spam.txt is in a folder that we can't look at because of some file permission issue, we'll just say, well, we, we'll treat it as though it's not there. So there's a lot of power in this function right here. Uh, I can go ahead and run this. Hopefully, this will actually be true. Oh, no, it's false. OK, let me figure out what's going on here. Um, Let's list folder return true. I can get rid of this else and just uh, de indent here, and that makes it a bit more readable. Let's see. Let me make this a little bit easier to read. Um, full folder name is this. Full folder name. Oh, what could go wrong with live coding examples? Um, oh, right. <laughs> this is, so, yeah, it's not if it's a directory, then return uh, that. It's also. Um, if contains spam.txt returns true, then we also want to return true. If it's false, we just want to check the next folder in this loop. So we also want to say, hey, if it contains spam.txt return true. Otherwise, loop back here and check out the next folder. Ah, oh, the wonderful world of programming. OK, invalid syntax. Where? Oh, sorry? Here? Oh, right. There we go. All right, and we have true. So that doesn't like look really cool. What I always love doing with my programs is adding needless debugging statements that slow it down, but it looks really awesome. So then I can have something like, like say, searching our folder. And then the output looks a lot cooler because it's like <laughs> searching, and then it's found uh, inside of <laughs> mammals slash primates slash apes slash humans. It's found that spam.txt file, um, but it's really cool. It prints out all of this output for, and you can see all of the folders that it's checking. It's doing a depth first search. It's uh, starting with eukaryotic, and then it's going through all the invertebrate folders of all of those, and then it's going through vertebrates, and it's starting with the birds, cassowaries, crows, eagles. And then finally, it stops right here. And this is the part where you say in that deep hacker voice, I'm in, um, when you finally found it. Um, of course, if you look back at this code, it can be kind of hard to parse. This is a recursive algorithm. Uh, but what would we have to do without this is, well, we would have to have a stack, uh, like just a Python list as a stack. And it keeps track of which folder that we've looked in. And we would just keep po uh, pushing more subfolders to this uh, Python list to search those, and then popping them off of that list as we've searched through those folders. Um, it would sort of be even uglier than this code right here. This is at least uh, a little bit easier to reason about. Here we can say, hey, if it's in the folder, just return true. Otherwise, we're going to continue uh, to look through every single item inside of that folder. Um, and if we found it, we'll return true. Uh, I don't even think technically this is uh, necessary because, yeah, it's already done. It's handled by the base case. So we don't even need that. Um, otherwise, hey, if we'll loop through everything in this folder, if it's a directory, we'll just find, uh, uh, we'll just search through that folder. Uh, and if it's just a file, then we'll just skip that and we'll just move on to the next folder. So right here, this contains a lot of power and it's actually kind of nice. So recursion is useful in situations where you have a tree-like data structure and you have uh, backtracking that's involved. Um, the tree-like data structure maps nicely because if you think about it, this is a very, a tree is a very recursive structure. Um, 
you can have a node and it has children which it branches off to. And each of those nodes uh, has children that it branches off to. So there's a recursive structure with uh, tree-like data structures. Uh, this appears in a lot of different places. If you have mazes, uh, if you want to write a maze-solving algorithm, you can have a recursive algorithm for that. Just every time you come to a point in the maze where you have multiple choices of where you want to branch off to, you just call the same, you make a recursive call to, on both of those cases. Um, so, uh, last thing, we have a little bit more time. Wow, actually we have a lot more time, this is great. Uh, I also just wanted to show, just for fun, uh, going back to that Sierpinski triangle, there's a lot of fractals and recursive artwork that you can do. Let me just bring that up. Um, right here. So uh, I don't know if you've maybe heard of this. Uh, there's the turtle module, and it, it implements uh, Logo. It's really great. Let me fire up. It comes with Python, too. You can just say import turtle. And this is used for teaching a lot of kids to program. You have a thing called a turtle, and it basically draws lines behind it, and you can tell it to move. So let's say move forward by 100 steps. And you can see, oh, okay, this has moved forward 100 steps right there. Tell it to move forward 100 steps again. Maybe turn left 90 degrees and move forward again. Uh, and you can do all sorts of like interesting etch-a-sketch art with this. Um, it also makes it really easy to just make graphics uh, with Python scripts. And so if I show you this Sierpinski triangle, um, here we have, uh, remember, a Sierpinski triangle looks like this. It's a triangle, and it has an upside-down triangle in the middle of it. And then that's just our, our function call right there. The function just draws a triangle with an upside-down triangle in the middle of it. And then it recursively calls itself three times for the three sub-triangles. Uh, uh, and then those will call themselves again and again and again. And the base case can just be once the triangles get so small that you can't really tell, we'll just have them do nothing and just return. They will stop making more recursive function calls. And here's the code for it. Um, I have all of these linked to that uh, page where you found the link to the handout, uh, bit.ly slash pyohio2018 recursion. Um, you can see I have a couple helper functions right here, but here's the main part. Draw a triangle. Uh, the base case is if it becomes too small, as uh, judged by all those xy coordinates, then it just returns. Otherwise, we're going to draw that main triangle, and then we calculate the midpoints right here. So for that upside down triangle, it's really just the midpoints of each of the sides of the triangle. We just draw a triangle there uh, for those midpoints, and then we make three recursive calls on those tinier triangles. So this is, you know, less than 50 lines of code, but we can do something really cool like this. And also what's nice is if you just make a few adjustments to this to uh, add some random variability, get the drunk Sierpinski triangle. <laughs> and then if you just keep drawing that over and over again, you get the drunk Sierpinski animated triangle. Um, <laughs> So you can do like some pretty fun stuff uh, with recursive algorithms. And so let's remember what's happening here. Well, not here. That's kind of crazy. But uh, let's, let's see what's happening right here. Um, we have, uh, so we want to do this recursively. It's something that's defined in terms of itself. Uh, remember, we have a call stack here. Each time we make a function call, we're pushing a frame object to that uh, function call. And it's remembering um, uh, where, like, Every time it makes a recursive function call and returns, it remembers where to return to so it can go on to the second recursive call and the third recursive call. And that keeps happening over and over and over again. So we're using the call stack to uh, keep track of all of that information. Um, and, we end, and we have a base case where once the triangles become small enough, we stop uh, making further recursive calls and just return. There's all sorts of these uh, fractal pieces of artwork uh, I have them linked here. Let's see, there's also the Sierpinski carpet, uh, which is essentially the same thing except with squares. We have a big square, and we cut out a middle square, 
and we have the eight remaining spaces, we just call that same function over and over again. Here it's slowed down so that you can see it drawing out over and over and over again. You can see it always starts off in the uh, top left area and then moves across uh, the top and then across the middle and then across the bottom right here. And it just does that over and over and over again. So if we look at this, uh, again, we have that base case of if it's too small. Um, but here, yeah, draw this uh, inner rectangle. Our base case, if it's too small. Otherwise, we just calculate where all those other eight surrounding squares are in our main square. And then we just draw, uh, we call eight recursive function, uh, we make eight recursive function calls to uh, draw out the carpet. So you can have a lot of fun with this. Um, let's see, we have a little bit more time. Uh, does anybody have general questions about uh, recursion uh, or something that you've thought of uh, while talking about this? Oh, okay, so uh, I can go jump back to factorials. Uh, remember factorial, we tried to calculate factorial 1009 and the recursive algorithm crashed. Uh, there's a way around that called tail call optimization. It's also called tail call elimination or just tail call recursion. Um, it's a very specific technique that's kind of also a hack. Um, let me go back to this. So let me just start off a brand new window right here. So let's do our recursive uh, version of this. If num is one, return one, else return num times factorial num minus one. This is our recursive uh, factorial. I'll just save this as test two. 1009, this is gonna cause it to fail. Oh, well, there we go. Uh, Let's make this a little bit easier, uh, like factorial five. I'm gonna copy and paste this into that great website, pythontutor.com. Everyone should bookmark this, it's a great tool. Um, let's visualize the execution. So the problem, the reason why it stack overflows is because uh, we keep adding too many of these frame objects and that eats up memory and at the thousandth time, Python says, I think something's wrong, you're making way too many function calls without returning. I'm just gonna return uh, or raise this uh, recursion uh, error exception. Um, and we can see right here, oh yeah, it keeps growing. And you know, normally it'll eventually hit the base case and then it'll start shrinking our call stack like that. Uh, if you want to uh, calculate like the factorial 1009, you can do something called tail call uh, elimination or tail recursion. All of this is, is making that the last thing that your function does uh, be the recursive call. Because let's think about this. We have that before and after part of our recursive call. Remember, in this case, it's all on one line right here. Uh, we're sort of like getting this number and we're doing this subtraction right here. Um, and then we're making this factorial call. And then after that returns, we're doing the multiplication and then returning it. Let's imagine like if we didn't have to do anything after the uh, last uh, uh, recursive call. Uh, in that case, we really wouldn't have to remember all of these frame objects right here. Um, remember, the only reason we hold on, the, the frame objects hold all of the local variables and also the return address. Um, in this case, the, return, the local variables are all of these different numbers right here. Uh, if the very last thing that the recursive function does is the recursive function call, there's nothing that happens after the recursive function. So really, when you make that recursive call, you don't have to hang on to that frame object with all the local variables in it because there's nothing that you're gonna do later on with it. Um, so you could just get rid of it. Uh, so essentially, uh, tail call elimination uh, is making the last thing your recursive function does is the recursive call. Then you don't have all of these frame objects being added to the call stack. 
And so you can make as many recursive calls as you want. You're not going to have a stack overflow because you're not adding frame objects to the call stack, so it's not growing uh, uncontrollably. Uh, I really want to show you this in Python, but I can't because Python specifically doesn't implement tail call elimination. Um, it's been brought up before, and I think Guido and other people have said, nah, we don't need this. Uh, there's probably lots of reasons um, for this decision. It makes the Python interpreter uh, simpler and easier to maintain. Also, it's behavior that would have to be done by all the other uh, Python interpreters out there. So like Jython or PyPy would also have to impl uh, implement this feature as well. But in a lot of programming languages like C or Java, you'll have this. Um, I really don't like tail call elimination because you kind of have to twist your code in knots to make sure that the last thing it does is the, recurs uh, the recursive function call. And it's sort of a giant hack just to make, uh, make it possible to use recursion, which in itself is pretty confusing and kind of hard to reason about sometimes. Um, so that is uh, what tail call elimination is. Wow, I didn't realize uh, I would be able to get through all of these. Let's go to that handout. Uh, 15, the recursive Fibonacci solution isn't used in the real world uh, because calculating large Fibonacci numbers requires uh, uh, like trillions of years to calculate. That's when it's making exponential calls because each call to Fibonacci is making two other recursive calls. Um, and recursion is a good technique to use when the problem involves tree-like data structures and backtracking. Um, yeah, uh, if anybody has any other questions, I can just start rambling on a little bit. Um, I totally forgot about the note I had written to myself that says, hey, at the hour mark, let's take a five minute break. So this, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for sticking by. Um, I can go into like some other examples, but yeah, uh, any questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. So that goes. Um, I forgot to show that. Uh, let's see. So remember, for Fibonacci, it makes those exponential numbers of calls, but it's also very uh, a large number of redundant function calls over and over again. And so a way we can fix that is with memoization. That's basically creating a cache. Like you know, every time we call Fibonacci three, it's going to return uh, two, and every time we call Fibonacci five, it'll return 21 or whatever the fifth Fibonacci number is. That's a, it's deterministic. It's always going to be the same. So we can just create a cache that remembers uh, all the arguments sent and then the return value. So that way in future calls, we can just, we don't actually have to do the calculation. We can just return the return value because we've remembered it. Um, I've implemented it by hand here We're using a dictionary. There is also, uh, you don't really have to do that yourself because Python, being a batteries included language that has pretty much everything in its standard library, has uh, something for this. Oh man, where is it? Okay. Fibonacci. Oh, here we go. So uh, here's the old code where I create the cache by myself. Here's something that's a lot simpler. I haven't changed. This is actually the original recursive Fibonacci function that I wrote. I've just imported func tools. Um, and then I have a decorator right here. That's func tools.lru cache. LRU stands for least uh, recently used, I believe. Um, this just checks like the last, you know, I could say like, oh, just remember the last 10 times uh, we were called what we returned for that. If you uh, leave it blank, I think it's like a thousand or something like that. Um, this basically does everything that I had done right here, where it's like, oh, you know, before I return, just add this to the cache and uh, just so you can remember it. And also uh, check at the very start of the function call, you know, if the number is, if the argument is in the cache, then we can return it. Uh, functools.lru cache does all of this for you. So if you have some deterministic um, function, uh, you can, and you don't want to do a bunch of, you sort of want to use up memory 
to save on runtime, uh, you can make that trade off by adding this uh, LRU cache decorator right here. And it does exactly the same thing as before. Notice we don't have pages and pages of output uh, to calculate the 10th Fibonacci number, and we're not uh, doing all these redundant function calls. So this does exactly the same thing that I was doing before. So it's a really nice thing to have. Um, remember, though, it's, this is only for deterministic functions. So if, uh, let's say I import random. So this is going to be non-deterministic, uh, you know, random.randint, you know, uh, random number between 1 and 10. This is going to return something different, or rather, something random, I guess. It will sometimes be the same. Um, right here. Let's say I create my own, like, my rand int. And it's just really a simple wrapper for random.randint110. So my randint is also going to be returning random numbers. Uh, let's go ahead and import func tools and have func tools.lru cache. Uh, and go ahead and define this. Turn random that randint. Oh, let me uh, set a min and max right here. Wait, uh, what? Hmm. It does not like that for some reason. So my rand int 1 and 10. Maybe I just can't run this. Uh, it's something about the interactive shell. Let me get rid of this. Import func tools. Let me look back at, yeah, so I always, oh, right, I do have to call this. I think that's the problem. So if I look at uh, my randint and I pass it 1 and 10 as the arguments, it's going to return a, uh, what? sorry, idle has a really weird behavior where if you have the cursor on a different line and you hit enter, it'll just copy and paste automatically, whoops, import random. One more time. OK, so uh, if you, you know, pass, oh, OK, so it returns a random number 1 to 10, except that LRU cache is remembering, like, oh, whenever you re uh, pass 1 and 10 as the arguments, always return 1. So this is actually <laughs> going to not be very random at all. Um, it's preventing uh, the code from actually calling any of this because before any of this, it's going to say, oh, hey, this, uh, these values for min and max are already cached. I'm going to return what it returned before. So you can't use this for uh, non-deterministic um, functions. And that can include things like I don't, if it's opening a file and reading the input, you know, the contents of that file could change uh, second by second, essentially. So you wouldn't want to use it there. Um, this is basically implementing memoization, um, which Oh, also, as another thing, that's not like a typo in my speech patterns. It's like memorization, except without the R. Um, in fact, I think if you just like go to Google and it's like, hey, I want to look up memoization. Oh, OK, it actually understands. It's not going to be like, did you mean memorization? A lot of your spell checkers will probably say, like, oh, you meant memorization. I can never text anybody the word memoization, because it'll just autocorrect to memorization. Um, but memoization is, uh, I believe the technical definition is specifically caching of return values uh, from functions. And so uh, functional programming, which relies a lot on recursion and sort of uh, deterministic functions, uh, makes use of memoization a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, any other questions at all? We have a, like a couple more minutes, although I'm getting really tired. My voice is starting to fail. Uh, but yeah, if, does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, great. So